size of the three loops added. Yeah, more or less. Huh. You need the bridge. Very cool. Very, very, very cool. Use it as uh, as base, as mm -hmm. cut off the stuff uh, you need to um, fix or, or improve other libraries. I think I did a trick like this with uh, ARAC. Have the, the source for AREX? For the REX system master library and so forth? Yeah. Okay, so it's not just binary, it's yeah, no, no source. But some of it's 68 gigs then. Yeah. So three chunks of it's gone. Okay. Uh, but the but can you can you put the version? Anything can happen. No, no, I mean it could be. <laughs> Licensing or any issues like that, but no. Yeah, it works, but the core is 68K. Yeah. It works. <laughs> but it's slow. And it's not fast. Well, yeah, I haven't seen any metrics. It's, I have. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> what application uses it that heavily that it doesn't care? <laughs> That's the argument. Uh, so, uh, UTF-8 support in Python is very important. 
UTMA support and Pearl was really important for me personally. You know, Andy did all the work. Because I had a pile of crap at the office, right, that relied on some internal um, yeah. Pearl modules. And all that stuff was expecting uh, strings in that format, and it was all broken when I tried to run on the Amiga. Of course. So, it seems very useful. Yeah. There's such a laundry list of other yeah. more important things. It's, it's, it's number 7,304. I, I think the world, <laughs> I think folks are over 10,000 bucks. You get a lot of comfort knowing that there is a list. Well, it's always a list. It's a list in the hands of the people who are, in theory, driving the platform. <laughs> not a technical issue. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> Quake, okay. I know. It's an open source experience of Quake 3, right? Yep. Um, on the table mm -hmm. with my SPE optimized drivers, this is with the old CTL. Loading the first level took possibly 10 minutes. That's yeah. so impressive. And, and I'm pretty sure it's New Hope is the one responsible for that. Hmm. Yeah, when you were talking about the slowdown. I could tell you right now, but. <laughs> But yeah, um, I mean, it would be nice to get the Could other solid mix out of the way. Yeah. I never play games much. So. <laughs> Open Arena is like my go-to for a quick Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Big textures. Yeah, that yeah. kind of thing. Hopefully yeah, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll say. Another thing to do. <laughs> You never know when yeah. it's complex. It could be the memory yeah. management for yeah. a computer. <laughs> we could just uh, grep. We could just grep through the uh, the header files. It's the collected header files. Yeah. Oh, hello, Bill. What's it called? I want to see. Damn sticker. <laughs> <laughs> Show, so it'll be okay. I will uh, hook you up. One moment. I like Daniel's man. 
No, 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 no. What I'm saying is, is, that is, is what functions do you need to optimize? Yes, yes. but uh, <laughs> just, just bear with me. Yes. But what I meant by that is, is, since I don't think we really know what libraries out there are using floating point heavily versus others, or maybe you do. Not really. Okay, so if you don't, that would be a way of, of, of generating a list of things to favorize over time. Yeah, that's one way. One way. Yeah. I, I prefer a profiler. That works too. We've got right one. Create a profiler and just go through. Do we have one? No. Okay, so right. Right. go through there and just uh, the easiest way to identify the uh, troublemakers. Mm -hmm. Different ways. I understand. I'm just thinking we don't have that ability. Yeah, going through header files, it's okay. But they don't always use the same keywords and stuff, and there's macros involved. I understand. All right. Blah, blah, blah. Or it gets annoying. Yeah. It's tough to know where to focus. Yeah, it, might, it might be better if we go per application. Pick an application that's running slow. Go after it. Yeah. Let's go after that one. And just yeah. analyze the crap. Maybe that's a better way than the generic just looking for. I agree. I, just I didn't think we had a profile. Uh, well, it's not hard to download. It's already full of time. With one option. It's out. With our stub functions and everything. I know it's on. I'm looking for the USB port. It's in the door. Push it in. There's a door. Oh, I see there's a hidden bag. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. challenge and a lot of people have a, a high learning curve trying to figure out how the OOPC system works, how you know how you structure it, your your writing in the uh, macro uh, language uh, or not, and just kind of chain all this stuff together. So the, the whole idea was to make this as simple as possible. So um, let me see if I can run any components of 
the, uh, the, big, the big problem I had, of course, is uh, I was making so many changes uh, uh, so rapidly in the, in the last couple of weeks uh, that I took and enhanced it right off into broken. And I, I broke the build and, and it, I wasn't able to finish uh, debugging or adding a lot of the features that I wanted to show on here. So, but last night uh, I was able to fix the build and now I'm back to uh, adding different pieces to it. So uh, I'll show you what I can uh, as far as it goes. So taking a, a, a look, so we can, we can launch any one of these components. Uh, I actually have a, 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 a sub doc thing that I'll launch off, of, off there for it. But let's say you just want to launch the GUI builder. Let's see. Oh, of course. Uh, I just grabbed the debug version. Oh, that's OK. Um, Sign for AP in front of my back, so we'll just tell it it's yeah, right there. Uh, sign and uh, okay. So, uh, so this is uh, what the the GUI builder is starting to look like uh, now under the the new version. I have an older version still on here from last year that actually does more mechanics, but. Uh, so it, it you know, gives you an uh, immediate list of all of the gadgets uh, that you can, you can create. You, you just go right ahead and just click on one of them, and it will create an interface for you, create a window for you, put the gadget on the window, and you just up and run it. And so in, in addition to the, uh, the, the graphical interface design, ends up outputting it, it's all maintained as an XML file, which is literally descriptive I mean, it's, the, the tags are as close to one-to-one -to, -one, uh, to the uh, uh, actual Lucy tags in the system that you can get. So if you look through the XML, you go, oh, well, I know what that tag is. And if I change the value, it's, it's going to pick it up. It's going to change it. And you're fine. So you, hopefully you know what you're looking at. Uh, but for most of it, you should never have to actually edit any of the uh, uh, XML. That's just a way to store it and keep track of it and everything like that. Uh, the, uh, the way that it's, it's, it's all going to integrate together is you have um, the ability first to design a graphical interface. Now, it, this, with, with ABD, it has a, a kind of a duality for development, which allows you to um, do rapid prototyping and also uh, full uh, CE development for compiling. And, and it accomplishes that by having a, uh, a program called uh, GUI Bits, which is my runtime uh, interpreter of the XML description file. So essentially, in, in essence, the GUI Bits is nothing more than the AVD template source, which has been out there for a long time, uh, and I know probably is, is still broken. It's fixed now. <laughs> no, uh, it's, it's the template program, but instead of having a predetermined uh, graphical interface, it's replaced with a parsing engine that says, oh, OK, you launched me from an icon. The icon represents the actual XML description file. And it runs through that, picks up that file, and scans through and creates in real time, basically. I mean, just in line as, as, it, as it runs across it. Oh, you want a window. You want these properties. You, know, you want the gadget and some other stuff in there. It takes all that layout information, and it creates it on the fly, and it brings that interface up, wrapped around with the rest of what the template does, which gives you a, a standard, what I consider like a standard Amiga application. That's an application template. It registers as an application. You use the application library of the system. It's a commodity. It shows up there. It's controllable there. It has menus you know, for just some, doing some basic stuff. And so it, it will run that. Uh, interface and, then, and now you have an uh, uh, interface that you, you run and you see exactly what uh, you uh, can interact with. And the next step with that is what can you do with it? So on, on the one hand, you can, you can simply use that for um, rapid prototyping as you go along and say, oh, you know, I, I want to design this interface and I just want to save it out, export it as GUI bits because all it does is dump the XML file with an icon you can double click and instantly there's your interface and you can play with that. Uh, but at the same time, you can also go right back to the uh, 
ABD as a designer, you can say, I want to generate this as C source, in which case you have the full template source that has been set up in your project directory, and everything that you have told it to do for the interface design, it, it will modify key parts of the template source, which are marked pretty clearly with auto-generated code will end up here. You can touch anything else around it, but it's going to put new GUI design and layout here, and it plugs it right into the code, giving you not only the, the creation code for it, but also the, the, the full uh, main loop, event handling, and you know the menus and, and everything, it's, it's all there. So going forward, uh, good bits. I can actually, let me show you the, uh, if I go into one of the projects I've played with, let's see this very well, uh, to-do list. Uh, this is kind of a standard one. Forget that you've asked me before. Sorry. Um, this uh, standard project uh, layout looks a lot like that. So you, you have typically one project file, the XML file, and then three different subdirectories. One is your C source. If you're degenerating from C source, by default it starts out empty because you may never need it. Uh, and then the other two are, are GUI bits and pref bytes. And those are both the runtime interpreted um, systems that allow you to you know, just generate the interface. So if you take a look, I should have one in here. And if I just uh, run this, it just created the interface. Now this is just a little sample that uh, was done. If we want to take a look, let me uh, da -da -da -da. let me run the SDK browser. What is this be slow? Oh, there we go. Um, so speaking of that, actually, this uh, the delay in the start here, as you can see on the bottom, it it parsed uh, 119 libraries and. 5,000 commands and all of that stuff. It live parses all of the SDK on launch. That's what the SDK browser has done from day one. And it's a, it's a delay in load. So I mean, one of the things that's going into the next version of the SDK browser is that is the live parsing every time you launch it is going to be a one time where everything is already, all that pre-parsed information is stored in a nice cache file and and hashed all up or whatever, so that when I launch again, it can still dynamically create the whole browsing libraries and everything, but it will do it like much, much faster. And then, because the, the only time you need to reparse technically, the only time you need to reparse it is when you make changes to the SDK. And so you can do a couple of things to automatically check to see where, where, where the change is, like there's the SDK version text file. Uh, if you launch it, they can take a look there and say, I recorded that you were version 53.30 and now you look like you're 53.31. Let me just throw out that cache file and recreate it for you quick. And then, of course, as a backup, uh, direct menu action or you know, user control to say, redo it. Because you might literally just change the pointer to the SDK and say, no, no I want to play this one. And now, now I want you to understand that one. So that, that particular thing is going to be um, coming out with SDK browser version, going to version three. That's one of the features that is definitely going in, is you have uh, that much, much faster launch time. And on the X5000, it's like one, two, three, it's up. But on any slower systems, you know, it takes a while. And it really doesn't need to be there. Uh, because it really, it really is. It's terrific because it's dynamic, but it's, it's redundant to do it every single time. Um, so that's one of the things that's, that's doing there. So let me use this and I'll take my little project file and drop it on there. And let's see. I'll tell the, the GUI builder to hide itself. I'll take this to full size. That's a trick I just learned, by the way. I had no idea you could hit shift and the uh, zoom gadget and it'll go to the full size. It's like little things. <laughs> I always, always oh, stretch oh, and move in the corner. Oh, stretch it on. does! <laughs> That's the hard way. If you're auto-scrolling, it doesn't just do this. 
It's like we need a book. Yes. Well, the wiki's great for that. Yeah. <laughs> you can print books. Or something. <laughs> I printed a book from it. I didn't know that was in there. Uh, okay. Um, let's let's oh, bump up the display font. And then again, it goes back to the Huge. All right. So as you can see, this is uh, what uh, the, the GUI builder actually produced as an XML description. Uh, it's very similar to the actual project file, except that it has a little bit of scripting at the top uh, so that it can be simply run as a script uh, instead of launched from an icon. And uh, so it does that little trick. And then it's got a header in here that says ABD type, uh, ABD file type is GUI fits. And that tells it, and the, and the version, of course, so it knows that if you're running you know, this version of the GUI bits interpreter program, it, this is actually a file for it. And, and it goes through, you know, and it, it, it lays out all of this stuff. And if you're familiar at all with the, the tags and for Boopsie, you're going to start recognizing this stuff immediately, you know, what these tags are. So we can change it if you want to. So, like, because the current generation stuff on, the, on this build of the Google Builder is not working, I can't really show it to you dynamically on this. But we didn't set up a, a title on there. Oh, I can't edit it yet. Let's do that. Um, we could change this new window to some other text and then just simply rerun the, uh, the GUI bits and it would immediately change. You know, so any of the changes. And this is what allows for kind of rapid prototyping. You can go along the line of saying, well, I'm just, just generating a generator. Forget about generating a C source and spending time to compile it. The end result is a larger binary, and in my experience, it actually runs slower uh, because of the difference in size. Uh, the, uh, this launches so quick, even though it's dynamically creating the interface on the fly, the, the program that does it is smaller, and eventually it will get even smaller because most of that engine will get moved into a shared library and the launch point for either GUI bits or crack bytes will be really small. And it just scans through the file and it creates the interface faster than if you pre-compiled it as an executable and ran it. And it takes that extra little, little more load time, a little more setup time to, to do it, and it's faster. So the, uh, uh, what, you, what you would then add to this, to beyond saying, okay, all right, so now I know that the interface is created, and it has this kind of layout, and it's uh, looking good. Is you would you want to add some real functionality to, to be able to take and say, oh, I've got some buttons on there, but now I want to uh, actually uh, perform some actions. And so, from the, the GUI bits to that extent, um, you will be able to perform add an action value, which will be stored for every one of the the uh, uh, basically user clickable items all of your gadgets, and it will perform a, a, your selection of a variety of different things. Uh, for the most part, it could kick off um, uh, any, any one of different scripting languages. So it'll support run, straight running a separate an external executable. So if you wanted to use this to create a, a program that was a graphical front end for an existing command line tool, you'd do that. You want to kick off a little bit of AREX. You want to kick off some Python. Um, yeah, anything is possible for because those action types will be supported within there, and the interpreter knows how to deal with it. In, in addition to that, it will have its own um, some its, its own bit of logic that you can do directly. Uh, what I'm currently referring to is like ABD script, and largely what the core of ABD script is is if you can think of it, uh, it'll have a little bit of programming logic that more or less follows like C. So you'll have some flow control and compare so ifs and, and uh, for loops and stuff like that you'll be able to directly script into a language that will you know be interpreted to run immediately so it's kind of a you know a, a pseudo basic kind of thing but the core really of what the AV script uh, is going to allow you to do is to interact with the objects uh, every single one of the objects created is known to the entire system because essentially you know it's built an array it has pointers to every single object every single object has got its properties 
And that's what you'd be able to do is say, you can say like, okay, you know, my button one, I now want to take and, you know, uh, set the color <laughs> of it to whatever. Anything you can do with the normal properties, get or set at ours, uh, you'll be able to do through ABD script directly. And that'll allow you again to continue with the rapid prototyping. You may decide this is the way the program should be distributed. That's just the way it is. Or when you finally get to that point where it's like, oh, I've got my interface and I've got buttons and I've added some actions on there. And you say, now I want to make it a closed source. You can still immediately go back and say, I want to generate it as C source. And everything, all the ABD scripts and all, all of that stuff will simply be translated to C and thrown right, generated right into to create a compiler. And it's really not, it's, it's not some great big, uh, you know, big interpreter you're bolting on. This isn't like Hollywood or, or trying to take and do a, a compile a Windows EXE of, of Python where the entire huge interpreter has to be um, you know, brought along with the binary. It's nothing like that because this is a very thin layer of direct translated calls to the OS. So when you, you know, when, so when you, you know, in a simplified language in, 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 as, you're, as you're editing it, you'll say, I want to get a value from this. You want to check to see what property is, exists for this particular object. That, is, that would translate straight up into a get at R or a get gadget at R, uh, you know, translation. So, and again, speed doesn't, it's, there's not a speed issue with it uh, because for the first, for, you know, first of all, it's going to be very, very quick, even just interpreting that and translating that for you on the fly. But if it ever isn't, you know, it gets it on doing some really, really heavy stuff uh, with it, you can say, well, I want to generate this as C and just compile it. And at that point, it's a straight up exactly as if you wrote it, you know, directly, no interpreter. Uh, so that's largely what that is. Now, uh, the other side of this is a, a program, it's a twin of the same thing called uh, a prep bytes. And the whole idea with prep bytes is that it's exactly the same thing where you have uh, a icon tied to an XML description of a program, including actions uh, potentially, uh, that when you double click on it, it launches, it's launched by prep bytes, which opens this up. And, and the, the thing is, is that it knows it's supposed to be a preference tool. So you design an interface with switches and file paths and, and all in the stuff that you need for your program as a preference. So look at the stuff in, in, in uh, you know, sys prefs, all of those programs, and you would simply graphically design them and then export them as a prep bytes program. And what prep bytes will do is give you that, uh, you know, save, use and save buttons, and it will use an XML standard description right from the operating system, save into EMV, save into EMVR, under your company name or designation, the XML file that is just, it's just a straight up saving of the state of all of the objects. So if you have choices, uh, for what the program should do. Uh, you design that any way you want, a little checkbox, some radio buttons, or you know, choose a selection, and it just simply saves the state of all of that for you. You don't have to know the XML, you don't have to know where it's saving it to. You've already really designated that as your, your uh, company uh, organization, or the operating system, you threw it in there. The, uh, and then, uh, in addition to, you say use, it will save a copy just to EMV, and you use save, and it'll say EMVR and EMV. And then in addition to that, it will signal your application that there is a preference change. So if you're live and running, you'll find out about it immediately. And the whole goal, of course, is to make writing a preference tool child's play. And 99% of the time with zero actual programming needed. So what I would like to see is the entire operating system preferences system, all, all the individual pieces brought to the same level, all using XML to save themselves, not IFF this and custom binary that and whatever. Some of them are more specific, you know. Well, isn't that, the kind of, isn't that kind of the reason why we have the preferences system in the application library? Yeah. I mean, we, we just want to leverage that. 
yeah. and, you know, it, what we, the only thing we have is we have, we're carrying so much legacy. If you look at the preferences in the current operating system, some of them are using IFF files, binary files, some of them are custom binary files, others are using XML. It's, it's a scattershot, it's just, you know, it's too much old when it could simply be redesigned and bring everybody to the same level. You know, so now there are, also, there are also options to keep this level of interpretation with the XML and close it. And that's done by uh, compressing, encrypting, or or obfuscating the actual XML. So instead of saving it, you know, you, you have, you saved it out as XML, now it's in this form, this is open and anybody could play with it. But if you wanted to keep it closed, but still have it run the same way, very fast and interpreted, then you would just save it out with that option, and it would take the bulk of all of that. All of these tags reduce, all these human readable tags reduce down to their numeric equivalents, and then get encrypted and compressed and, and then turned into a block of text. So you end up with a very simple XML uh, file that has this blob of all the stuff, and the interpreter knows exactly how to reverse it. So it would just, and that, so that allows you to still distribute it via email if you wanted to. And you and, and keep it closed or leave it open at, at your choice. You know, so that's one of the things that the, the commercial version of uh, AVD will allow you that, those options. The, uh, the free AVD stuff will not. The free AVD, uh, all the tools, which, which are a lot of the same thing, will be out there publicly for everybody to use, but they'll be limited to produce freeware software only. Non-pay, and I'll do everything I can to make sure it says that in the binaries. So when you when you run an interpreter for and it identifies it, it knows it's free AVD, uh, then it will have a menu option and something in the about and say, this was designed with free AVD. If you paid for this, contact me. <laughs> because you should not be, nobody should be asking money for this, it was produced with free tools for free software. Um, but the commercial owners, they can do anything they want. They can generate the C, they don't even have to say they built it with AVD, that's not required. And there's no royalties. Uh, this is a one-time one -time purchase to get into it and, and you know, open it. So, okay, now, what I can show you is some of the other, some of the progress. Uh, also, so get rid of the SMP browser for a moment. Uh, this is, this is over. And we have the, uh, oh, there we are. I'm used to the speed of the system. So. I've got a debug thing going on, and that's what, that's what's going on. It's, it's, nor it's normally, it's quite instantaneous. The new uh, AVD text editor. Um, one of the most significant uh, parts of this is that this uh, new text editor is based around uh, the rich editor gadget uh, from Simon Archer and, and Peter Gordon, which we have licensed to use in AVD. So now CodeBench and AVD will be using the same core uh, text editor, bringing all of the advantages that they have, you know, been putting into it over the over the years, and uh, it's been it's been terrific. And I even got a new update from uh, from Simon uh, like yesterday of the gadget class. He found a little thing of a new feature that we were talking about, fixed it, gave a new version. So it has the license to distribute it. It will be distributed with uh, with the AVD uh, and uh, just usable. And, I'll, and this, the same class will be used. And there, so let me kind of get the project thing out of the way for the moment. And if I load up a file, let's pull something out of, what did I hold out of my Xena Manager? Because um, I've got some C source generated for that. So I'll take a look at this. And here you go. I have not added the dynamic, dynamic fonts uh, stuff to it yet, unfortunately. But you can see that we're, we're immediately got, we finally have or I finally have on here. Context sensitive highlighting, uh, collapsible uh, code sections, 
and, and just many, many, many other features. And so uh, cut, copy, paste, undo, redo, uh, uh, and, and of course load and save, all of these things are um, been plugged in. I, the interface around this right now is, is very minimal because I've only had it for a short time. Uh, but it's, it's actually pretty decent to work with, and the documentation is not bad. Uh, so, and, and the support from Simon to, you know, keep making it better and stuff has, has been really good. So, so I'm very happy about that. So, I, you know, I really appreciate their willingness to uh, make this available. And uh, hopefully, um, this will eventually, that this class will eventually be uh, available for everybody to use. Currently, I do not have the license to um, add to the GUI builder the ability to design interfaces with this schedule. Uh, but once they decide it's ready, and you know, hopefully, you'll be, everybody will be able to use this. Yes? What uh, languages will uh, do the syntax highlight for? Uh, it actually does a whole section of them. Uh, it identifies, and it's user extendable. So that's a very good point. Uh, it, knew to, it knew to highlight it this way uh, simply because it is a C file. So it picks up off of the uh, extension on the file. And I can actually show you this. So if I open up, uh, and we go to, uh, uh, you got it installed on it. Well, I can, I can pull it out of uh, uh, ADD as well. Go to ADD. No, so normal. Well, let me, let me show you where it is normally, because when it's actually installed, same thing as, as CodeFetch. So this is actually a good point, because you, you can use um, some of the tools that Simon has already developed in CodeFetch to edit these files and, change, and, and create new themes and add new pieces to it. Or you can do it by hand. It's XML and it's extension. I will, through ABE, be creating my own preference system to allow the user to do that just as a cohesive whole. So those that want to just work completely with ABD, they'll be able to do all that stuff as well. But the um, if we go into uh, ENV, uh, where are we at? We go into even ENV art and under oh yeah, classes, gadgets, rich editor. There is this file. Uh, Default.kvkvd, uh, which is an XML description of all of your hotkey assignments to key actions. So this is where you can tailor what kind of hotkey layout, what works best for your keyboard, which you're most familiar with. And it looks like this. Now they did not create a profile for a .kvd file. So it doesn't know this yet. But you could easily do that. And then just provide the tags and, and say, okay, well, this is basically just um, some, you know, it's a different tag base. It's essentially XML or some close variation. And so it just had, it goes down. You can you can take and you can you can make any of your editing changes here for like right Amiga key is used to toggle the mark block and then you know select line characters or jump to the end or what you know whatever the whatever the commands are. So, but if I open up into syntax, here's what you were asking about. Uh, in here, there's a series of files already supporting C, uh, CSS, uh, Amiga Doc, Amiga Guide stuff, uh, PHP, Python, Rex, and XML. And so, if we look at C, which you can see is quite extensive, that's like the first one, the biggest one. Now it knew that it's a .xml, so it highlighted it according to .xml. And in here is where all the magic happens for that automatically. This extensions entry here lists all of the extensions that it will recognize. So C, CC, CPP, CXX, H, all of those files with that type of extension will take and uh, use this mapping. So that's that's how that's uh, achieved, which is it's, it's a pretty good pretty good system. It's very open. Uh, I like that about it. Uh, from a programming standpoint, uh, you can. You still have the opportunity, because the, the gadget class does not uh, do the file I/O for you. It, it doesn't open up files and save files. So you do that, and so you have the opportunity to uh, interject your own. So, like, if, if I have um, 
uh, I want to load a make file. Well, make file doesn't have an extension, so this system doesn't pick it up. But since I can identify it as a make file, and then I can load it as a make file, and then I can tell when I when I hand it to the editor, I can tell it it's actually like make file dot mk or something to pick up a syntax highlighting for the make file. And it's completely transparent to the user. So there's some things the programmer will still have to take into. Well, there's quite a few things the programmer makes a decision on what to do around the class. But it is by far the, uh, the, the best editing uh, class available. Uh, or almost available. Spellcheck? Spellcheck I don't, I, I, don't, I don't know about, except that you can hook for it. Um, so, I mean, if you're, you're really looking for a lot of the features that it can do, of course, look at CodeBridge uh, and what he's doing. But what I'm going to end up doing with it under ADD is going to be different. So a lot of the things are, are going to be the same kind of features, but it'll be tailored more for uh, what I want it to do and more of, a, more of a focus. And one of the biggest focuses for me is that uh, it will understand the, and fully be able to navigate your C or C++ source. And you know that includes like the, very, a lot of the features that you, know, you may have seen yesterday as I was going through showing the uh, the framework for the Ethernet, being able to highlight in a function, hit a key, jump back from the reference to the source, you know, and have suggestions as you type and all that stuff. You know, so the way that um, uh, Simon's approach to it will be different than my approach. Uh, so even though we're using the same classes, it's definitely going to kind of be some differences. Um, and hopefully mine will be tailored more specifically for, for my kind of stuff. Like I have no interest in having a system to create Hollywood scripts or whatever. And you could do that, of course, because it's a full text editor and you can use it for anything you want. So, okay, uh, text editor. So that's pretty much a really quick covers the text editor. I did add my one feature. Uh, yeah, so far. Uh, one of the things I want to strive for with ABD is, is to allow you to work now. I want to just jump right back in where I was, what I was doing, quickly switch to projects. I don't want to be forced to go through creating a project, describing it, you know, having to create an area for it. No, no, no. You want to jump in and do the interface, just roll right into the interface. Once you decide, you want to generate it as C source, then you go through a couple of quick steps and say, I want to unpack the, this template to here, there's my source. Now create the changes, there's my program. And of course, you'll, you'll be able to benefit from all the, the other project handling you normally would expect. And uh, especially in terms of the uh, versioning and uh, naming, uh, putting all your, uh, so the about stuff will fill in automatically and your, your name and company stuff or whatever will end up in there. For me, I, I have a, um, uh, and which is part of ABD, is a, a program I wrote many, many years ago uh, called ABD, or Increment Version, is what it was originally called. And it's my, it's my own software for reading in a single header file, picking out the version number, bumping it to the next revision, modifying it again during the build process every single time. And it automatically adjusts. So it builds up, it has, it's a four position one, major number, minor number, maintenance number and build, rolls up 250 builds, it becomes 0.1. 250 more builds, 0.2. And eventually that rolls from major to minor to major. And, and at any point you can say, okay, it's actually 1.0, let's just rev, rev it to 1.0. But it allows, as a developer, it really allows you to keep track of every single build you do. And along with that is the whole series of defines, which have your company name, your URL information, and everything in that same header file, including your, um, including a pre-created uh, Amiga version string, which you can then, so it's already ready for you to go, so when you actually, in your source, you can declare that and end up with a properly searchable string so that the version command can find the actual name and version. And I have two, I have, I define two different versions of it because in some cases, I'm like a built a driver, um, it would be released as a two, two version number stuff and it's like 53.1, uh, and leave the rest of that off. And, but for my stuff, I usually want to see all of them. So 
I have that same string that gives me all four numbers. You know? And, uh, and it, has a, it has a specific logic to it. Uh, so like the SDK browser is, uh, publicly released is currently 2.1.4.0, which means that it was the 2.1 release of the software, but four different bugs were found and fixed in that release. That's the only time the maintenance number gets, gets bumped. Um, so that, that also tells me which version of the release, because by that time you're usually on to stuff that's gonna go into the next major one, and you gotta know you went back and fixed that one thing, made a build, build it to one again, and you know, have some way to track it. So that's why I adopted that for position method. Um, okay, so text editor, um, uh, SDK browser, GUI builder, text editor, and debugger. Um, working with uh, ElfKill. <laughs> I don't really know about anybody, anything else. Um, uh, DB101, uh, which is, uh, he's, he's working on a new version based on a rewrite. It's a secret. What's his secret? Oh, it's, yeah, a yeah, secret it's the secret edition. Yeah, which is on OS 4. Do you see it? It's a secret. Yeah, it's wrong. <laughs> yeah. Implicit NDA. Yeah. That sound is the uh, side of gas. So <laughs> <laughs> Which is the secret. Yes. <laughs> so um, I, I really don't have anything on here to, to, to demonstrate any of the features of DB101, but it is pretty nice and it does have, already it has um, a limited AREX interface, which allows you to kind of poke it on what you need to do. So in the, um, in the text editor, at the source level, you'll be able to, over on the left column where you've got collapsible sections and line numbers, um, which you'll be able to take and say you don't want those. But the, uh, you can also tag uh, breakpoints within the editor, and then it'll send those breakpoints to uh, DB101, and when you jump into debugging it, then it already knows what you want to do. And this thing has uh, two different ways to start debugging a, a program. either by selecting the file uh, of a program that hasn't been run yet, and it knows here's where it is, and, and it, uh, it may ask you where the root of it is, or if you just, like I do, I actually say, I want to load the binary. I want you to select the file of the binary itself right within the main, with all the source around it, and then it knows uh, to bring up the source and everything. And you can, and you can still, you can do breakpoints and everything right within here. So you can select a file and then launch it from here and start taking it through the debug process. Or, if you don't have that option, he does have the uh, ability to grab a live program and start managing for, for debug, which I think would work most of the time. I mean, the, the debugging at this level is a very tricky thing to do, uh, running on top of the media OS. You know, so you, you, a lot of things go wrong and you know it, it can crash. But it is still, right now, it's by far the best thing that we have. And it's certainly the, the best visual um, interface. I'm very, I'm, I'm very keen to see what it's going to come up with next. Uh, and I'll be working with them as close as I can to make sure that all of the uh, interface stuff is in there. Uh, so, you know, because like when I, I launched it from ABD, but it came open on the workbench screen. Now, obviously, I can move everything from ABD to the workbench screen. Uh, so I just want to move the text editor to a public screen, workbench, and then boom, it's here now. So there it is. You know, so you can run all of this stuff off of the workbench or custom screens. Uh, I'm also going to be fully supporting uh, the kind of new uh, user screen preferences system. So rather than creating a custom screen on my own, if you set it up right, you can have the operating system based on the user's settings dynamically open up and close any screen associated with that, with any application. And that has significant advantages over the, doing a stock custom screen yourself, um, one of which is because an entirely different set of graphical preferences can be associated with that screen. So you can really launch it on your own screen and theme the heck out of it, you know, and end up with your own look. Um, so, Okay. What else? 
So I will be continuing to work on this. I'll hopefully be doing another demonstration at the show, and I might even be able to show you how the, uh, the mechanics work uh, for for that. I can I can try to uh, one time here. Uh, see if it runs. So I'll quit, and uh, this this doesn't have a good one tied up to it yet. But on the same one, I have. Um, version of the original? That's, yeah, this should be from uh, 2017 in the West. Yeah, oh no, that's a that's a metal build one. That's still not gonna work. Quit the GUI builder. one is 14 years old. Uh, so it didn't, it doesn't know everything, but it, it did have, it did have some things uh, on the mechanics, and I can show you a quick, a, a few of them. Although it's, uh, uh, I will warn you, there's a lot of things that are, have been fixed for a long time that, uh, you know, are, are still on here as weird side effects. So, but the idea, of course, is there, you know, here's your, here's your panel and say, I don't have a toolbar on here, I don't have icons for this. But if you just wanted to jump right in and say, you know, oh, I just want a button. A uh, button. Now, this is one side effect. Uh, it's supposed to have your, your tree, tree view here. I think to work around it, I need to tilt open a new window and then just ignore the guy. And then I have the, the tree view for it. So I've got a button, and if I want to take that, another button, another button, another button, another button, whatever you want to take and do there. And uh, I want to change this from uh, horizontal to vertical layout. Uh, I want to name name this guy, and then I can navigate, moving him around. You know, it's anywhere you want. Create a create another vertical group. Let's put thread in there, and uh, take this back to a vertical group to make this a horizontal group, and then we'll put some more stuff in there. Uh, space um, and a drop down gadget, and then you know, oh, I don't like that, so I'll, I'll remove it. And it's, so I'll remove those. And you can go to the clipboard and scan it. It's looking a little crazy right now. There's a refresh issue. Um, collapse it to different sizes and everything like that. So um, it's a work. What we want, let's just make something really, really simple. And, uh, and then I'll be a, and then a horizontal group.